everyone, and welcome back to the Neurodiverging Podcast. I'm Danielle Sullivan, and I am your host. I am so excited to give you today's episode. This was recorded back in October of 2021, and I have been just chomping at the bit to get it out to you. Today, we are talking to an expert interventionist for at-risk neurodivergent teens, Aaron M. Huey. Aaron is an internationally known lecturer on archetypal imagery, body language, and martial arts, and he is the founder and president of Fire Mountain Programs. Since 2004, he's run kids' camps, teen camps, and family programming, and in 2009, he and his wife Christine opened a residential mental health and dependency recovery treatment center for teens ages 12 to 17 in Colorado, right down the road from me. Fire Mountain Residential Treatment Center was named one of the top 50 healthcare providers in the United States in 2019, and in 2020, it was named one of the top 100 innovators in healthcare. Aaron is also a family consultant, a teen coach, and an addiction interventionist who facilitates very powerful parenting events, and he's a very happy husband and father of two young adults. This is such a meaty discussion today. We're going to be discussing what causes risky behavior in neurodivergent teens and how parents can help, what interventions are most useful for at-risk neurodivergent teens, Aaron's ADHD childhood and his experiences with addiction, bullying, sexual assault, and recovery, and how the thinking about risky behavior and neurodivergence and trauma has been changing over the years. So it's a really good episode. I hope you'll hang in with us and enjoy it. Before I introduce Aaron, I'd like to thank all of my patrons for supporting this episode of Neurodiverging. I could not do this without you. It takes hours and hours to set up these interviews, to do the research, to do the audio and video editing. It is intense, and so I could not make time for that work to happen without your financial support. So thank you so much. If you would like to be a patron, patrons receive exclusive access to tons of behind the scenes goodies and extra information and downloads, including access to my back catalog of recorded neurodiversity related webinars, self-help and coaching downloads, a 15% discount to my course, Autistic Emotions Explained, coaching discounts, and much more. If you want to be one of these amazing folks and support the Neurodiverging podcast and keep it going, please come on to patreon.com slash neurodiverging and check us out. You can support at a dollar a month, five dollars a month, and on up. You could also, I'll put a link in the show notes, just send a one-time donation over PayPal. And that money also goes to support uh, the my ability to make this podcast for you. So I really appreciate your consideration of that. A couple notes before we get right into the interview. We do have some discussion of drug use and addiction, sexual assault, and bullying today. This happens around the 20-minute mark, and it is not explicit, but please take care of yourselves and please consider whether this might not be a good fit for you, if that's something that you have to think about. One more thing is that Aaron suggests during this interview that parents educate themselves on basic information about how the brain works, and that can be really hard to do. So what I have done is I've put together a very short list of three or four books that I recommend uh, as a coach, as an introduction to brain sciences that, that are Uh, approachable and accessible to to lay readers. And those are in the show notes. So go ahead and scroll on down whatever podcasting app you're on and check those out if you're looking for information about how to get started on how the brain works. There is a very good free book available to download that I highly recommend in there, as well as a couple that are, you know, you can buy as paperbacks and they're not too expensive. And they're really great introductions to how the brain works so that you can parent better and understand you know, what your children are going through as they grow. So I hope that will be helpful to you. Please also check out the show notes for all of Aaron's links. He has an amazing podcast, which we'll talk about a little bit in the show called Beyond Risk and Back. And I hope you will check it out. Without further ado, here is my interview with Aaron. Enjoy. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks for joining us on Neurodiverging. How are you doing? My pleasure. I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm so glad you're here. So can you tell us a little bit? You have a lot of things going on, a lot of different projects. <laughs> Can you tell I'm ADHD? I uh, also struggle with having eight things going on at once and I'm just autistic. So, but you have your ADHD yourself. Very much so. You have a big background learning about it. Yes. Um, you run and have built up your own treatment center and you work with a lot of parents as a 
parent interventionist and a parent coach. Yes. Right. What 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 did I miss that you that you? Oh also my did? God. <laughs> so uh, many things. Well, so here's an interesting thing. Uh, we shut our facility, our adolescent residential facility, down eight day, uh, eleven days ago. Oh, we wow. uh, we hit a. A, one of those letters in the mail where our property insurance, because we own the property that the mm-hmm. facility is on, our property insurance decided to raise our rates from $20,000 a year to $470,000 a year to protect my property from fires. We're, we're here in Colorado. There were a lot of fires here last mm-hmm. year and we had some near us. And because we had children, they decided don't want to cover you anymore. So we could not find a lower offer than 360,000. And so we had to shut it down. I can't, uh, you know, I'm not, there was not in this business to make a lot of money. I was in this business to help families in that way. Mm-hmm. The support of families, and everything will continue. Uh, my parent coaching, my parent interventions, uh, my adolescent coaching program. We're going back to running kids camps and teen camps. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the, my podcast, all this type of stuff. Um, but we are no longer in the residential treatment business. So now I also find myself supporting parents who are looking at getting into questioning whether they should be looking towards residential treatment care for their kids and uh, coaching them along the process, whether it's helping them ask the right questions and helping interview uh, the program they're looking for and working with their family while their kids are in it Mm -hmm. or helping them keep their kids at home. Um, And that's a big part of the next phase of my life. Now, to answer the first question, as you just see me <laughs> diverging off of the path into the yellow wood. It's called um, neurodiverging. You can diverge away. <laughs> I was also asked by the United States Martial Arts Hall of Fame to create two courses for instructors, certification courses for instructors sponsored by the United States Martial Arts Hall of Fame. Uh, one for teaching traumatized children martial arts and a second for teaching traumatized women. Uh, I have an international and national martial arts team. I've been a lifelong martial artist. And this was something I never expected, but had one of those entrepreneurial Oprah moments where you <laughs> find yourself in the elevator with the person you didn't know you must talk to. And I said all the right things and uh, find myself now creating a course for the United States Martial Arts Hall of Fame, which I'm extremely proud of. That's so exciting. Yeah. That's a lot of big changes in a very short period of time. Yes. Uh, August 27th to October 11th, I have shut down uh, the top performing adolescent treatment facility in the United States, right after winning top 100 innovator of healthcare in the United States. So yeah. it's, it's been one heck and I'm using the word heck. So I don't scream profanities of a, of a year this year for yeah. everybody, for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yikes. So going out of your kind of old chapter and into your new chapter, yeah. what, do you want to focus on most? That's Helping like, parents keep their kids at home. Just, yeah, keep them at home. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about that? So you work, sure. I know you work with a wide range of neurodivergent yes. types, neurotypes, right? Um, I, you're ADHD. Extremely. <laughs> <laughs> so I think like, like most parents, um, the goal is always to keep the child in the home for as long as possible. Yeah. Can you tell us more about kind of before you shut your treatment center, what it, what kind of family, what, what's going on at home that has families looking at residential? Yeah. So we're talking about, and, and this is why my podcast is called beyond risk and back at risk behavior was, you know, seven months to three years ago. It's been going on for a long time and steadily or quickly getting much, much worse. And what I see a big percentage of parents trying to do when their kids um, neurodivergent uh, behavior or neurodivergent um, personality starts to truly spin into very risky decisions. And this leads to maladaptive coping strategies when we begin to experience the pain and the suffering of neurodivergent ADHD, bipolar and borderline personality disorder, for example, are three of uh, I I want to use the word death sentences of adolescent um, 
diagnoses. You, you, they, they, when you have a kid and they go, oh, I think your kid's bipolar. You're like, ah, oh, crap. That's a lifelong one. Same with ADHD, mm-hmm. same with a borderline personality disorder. Now, the issues that come up with it is that we tend to, as parents, begin to focus on the results, not on the, the, the source. We focus on the fruit, not on the root. And your kid smoking weed every day, your kid self-harming, your kid being completely overwhelmed and dependent on video games, um, your kid's anxiety and depression literally running the house, not just your kid's day in, day out experience, but literally no one can go to work. No one can have a meal. No one can, the, the, the whole family starts to satellite around this child's experience. Um, our focus goes there. Our focus goes on to this kid. Our focus goes on to the problems. Our focus goes on to the results or the actions directly. The, the, uh, the, the, the thing that comes before results, right? If we keep going down in that iceberg, I love to di- diagram this as an iceberg, the, the very tip, the thing with the most exposure and focus, the thing we see first are the results. Yes. Right under that is actions. Right under that at the waterline are the feelings. And the reason why I say at the waterline is because the feelings are usually the biggest motivator for maladaptive actions and therefore uh, uh, unfavorable results. So at this waterline, we have these overwhelming feelings that are creating these actions. There are no, there is no gap between the feelings and actions. Adults are supposed to have a gap. Children are not. Developmentally, they're not. But see, under that water, there's more feelings. And that's what happens when we get into mentorship, coaching, and of course, therapeutic intervention process is that we start to uncover and reveal feelings we didn't know about. Now, below feelings are thoughts, but we're starting to get dark and cold in this water. Underneath those thoughts are experiences, like core root experiences that this child has had. And under that, all the way down at the bottom of the iceberg, the purest water, the purest ice, the coldest, the deepest, the most, uh, has the most pressure down there. Those are the prime influences. What happened in utero? What happened when they were born? Was there adoption in play? How were birth parents doing? What was the chemical makeup, DNA, genetic expression through epigenetics? So to go back up to the top, everything starts at the roots, the base of this iceberg. And that is prime influence, Mm -hmm. not the group of friends they're hanging out with, not the video game they're playing prime influence that leads to experiences in life that leads to the thoughts we have, what we think about the world that leads to what we feel that leads to what we do that leads to our results. So the biggest problem, the roundabout way of answering your question is it's that we're focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on my kid just got expelled from school because they had a backpack full of pills. My kid stole my car and crashed it and was drunk. Uh, my kid I cut themselves and they cut themselves too deep and we had to go to the hospital. Now they're in an acute unit and they're telling me to come pick them up and that the kid should go to residential. What do I do now? Mm-hmm. Of course, we're going to focus right there on these results. They're the loudest screaming, but it's not the work. Yeah. The, the work is the purest ice in the iceberg all the way at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And what interventions do you tend to focus there? Because I, I mean, we work a lot as a coach with the thoughts to feelings kind of yes. trajectory, right? So how, how do you get under those thoughts? That well, seems there, to me to be the tricky part. <laughs> it is. It is. The therapeutic process is, is what is required, right? There's mm-hmm. thoughts to feelings or, or even emotions to feelings, mm-hmm. right? These are uh, thoughts to feelings, feelings to actions. Those things can generally get addressed in seminars. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I love seminars. I'm a seminar leader. I'm a seminar <laughs> instructor. Um, but it's seminars. Motivation and therapeutic intervention are two different things. Mm-hmm. You can motivate a kid to change. I, I had a client, client no call, no show today. When I talked to him three days ago, he was motivated to show up today. There was plenty of motivation, but motivation isn't change. Discipline of motivation is change. Consistent motivation of change is change. Consistent action based in discipline of motivation is change. 
Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're still not dealing with, and that's where the therapeutic process comes in. That's the difference between therapy and motivation. Motivation is about your state change. I got on the phone with this kid and he's smoking too much weed. He's, he seems to be sp some, some spectrum uh, protocols, mm -hmm. but he was so excited. He wants so badly to have the fresh start in life. Mm -hmm. So I could utilize that that energy that he had, and I could reflect it back to him. And that amplified his excitement and the desire for success and all of his plans and dreams started coming out. But see, that's a state change. Mm -hmm. That's, I was sad and now I'm happy. Yeah. Therapy is a trait change. Mm -hmm. That trait change are, I smoke weed every day, three times a day. And now I don't, mm -hmm. that takes a minimum of 90 days yeah. of daily intervention work. So that's the first thing is that to get underneath, you have to add a therapeutic process to a motivation process. Number two, and what I believe is the most important thing, and it's why I talk to uh, the parents. It's why I'm a parent interventionist. They call me and say, my, my kid hasn't been to school in six months. All they do is play video games. Well, I'm not going to intervene on the kid. Yeah. Right. Cause at best, I'll get a motivated excitement. I'm going to intervene on the parents mm -hmm. because what we did to get the top results, the top recovery results in the United States for an adolescent treatment program had less to do with the kids and more to do with the parents. We did great work with the kids, but our success came from our parent intervention. Our success came because of how much we included the parents in the recovery process. You know, Dr. Patch Adams was an early mentor of mine. And he said once, your, your grandmother does not have Alzheimer's. Family has Alzheimer's. Treat the family. If you have a child with cancer, everybody in the family deals with cancer. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a family member who's committed suicide, everybody in the family deals with death and suicide and that depression that comes with. If we don't treat the family, even if a child goes away to the best program in the United States, in the world, but they come home to a place that hasn't changed, that's like trying to plant a fertilized, fermented, pristine seed in soil that is compact, mm -hmm. that, that is stagnant, that is static. It must you must till the soil at home while your child is fertilizing their seeds and treatment. Mm -hmm. So if the child's change is going to be successful, the parents must change the house. And that has been the biggest failure of the industry. And it's where our success came from. Our parent intervention was top of the line. And it's why, as I left, as I walked away from adolescent residential treatment, and I said, I'm continuing my work, I had to take the part that was the primary reason for our success to continue. And that's parent intervention. Mm -hmm. I also agree from the perspective of an autistic coach that parent intervention is the most important piece of solving childhood behaviors and issues with autistic kiddos. But of course, I don't work with quite as intense cases as I believe you do. <laughs> You know, what's amazing, I've worked with a lot of kids on this on the spectrum over the years. And it's very clear. And I and I, I really think that this is the most beautiful example of a, a, a behavioral disorder, right, that, that we could use to say, do you expect the kid to change? Mm -hmm. Like if your kid has cancer, do you expect them to stop? Yeah. What changes do you have to make as a parent? If, if your kid has ADHD, you can medicate it to try to manage it, mm -hmm. mitigate it at best. Mitigate, yeah. Yeah. Ma ma management is a long shot, but the changes you make at home, mm -hmm. the changes you make in your understanding of ADHD, those are that's lifetime changing. Yeah. It's the framing. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I've always, I've always told parents, if, if your kid's on the spectrum, they have a different alphabet. Like it's that basic. They have a different language than you have. You can scream at them in your voice all you want. It won't land. But if you scream at them in theirs, if you love them in theirs, if you whisper to them in theirs, like it's, it's, 
It's not the content of your voice. It's the context of your voice. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. No, I completely agree. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this field to start with? Cause that yeah, was I was a complete <laughs> F up. as a kid. <laughs> I put my parents through the ringer. I was a, I, I, I was abandoned by my biological father. A really amazing man showed up into my mother's life. They're still together to this day. I'm 52 years old. He was the dad. Everybody wishes they had. My mom was extremely progressive and smart, um, was, is, and, and did a really good job. Um, I was a handful. I, I was a, I was a pretty big handful. I was hard on my younger brothers. I was hard on my teachers. I was hard on my friendships. I was just, I was tough. And I had a great environment to grow up in. Um, and I'm a Gen Xer. So I still had the environment that God forbid I told my mom I was bored yeah. because you were gone until lights, lights out. Mm -hmm. And that, thank God, uh, because, you know, the, the experience of what we have now is in quarantining and things like that. I, I would have never survived. Yeah. Um, so on top of the abandonment from my biological father and the ADHD, um, there was a lot of abuse from, from schoolmates and, and people in school. I was bullied mercilessly. Thus my entry into martial arts uh, in, in seventh grade. Um, and then after high school, I went to acting school. I was sexually assaulted by my best friend who had the exact same name as my biological father. And there's my psyche laid bare for you. <laughs> um, and that one really sent me spiraling. I, uh, I had started uh, uh, experimenting, and I, and I mean that in the truest form, yeah. uh, with uh, weed at, at 12 years old. And it was just a here and there thing. But after my first year away at acting school, um, it was daily. And it mm -hmm. stayed daily for another seven years. Uh, I, and then I was 28 years old when I told my parents I was an addict. And I was uh, uh, very, very um, unfulfilled by the life that I had created for myself, all of which was designed to keep me um, from the depression that was that just crippled me in, in silence in my mm -hmm. head. Um, so at 28 years old, I got sober and a few years uh, during that time, I'd been working at a kid's camp and it was, it had been the only job I had ever had where I'd stayed sober during the workday. And, uh, but I had, I worked summers and then only after schools and had to pick up other jobs. It was just, I had a miserable, uh, miserable time trying to be a good man. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once the sobriety hit, uh, my my ex-wife was unbelievably uh, desirous of a co-parenting partnership and made every single effort to um, to create a, a co-parenting experience with me. Uh, the boss I was working with was very um, uh, uh, willing to, to see me forward from this rock bottom point. My parents were unbelievable. I had a great place to fail. Mm -hmm. And from that place of failure, I just started the, the law of audacity, who dares wins. I'm going to do it. I believe I know what these kids need, so I'm going to do it. And that, that started with running little kids camps and teen rights of passage programs and just doing right by the communities that I had harmed with my behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and one day a parent said, can my kid just come live with you guys? Mm -hmm. And we said yes. And a week later, we had six boys and four on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, as six months later, moved my own kids out of their childhood home um, and started this home. And it kept growing and kept growing till it was the top performing treatment facility in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the story from the dinosaurs to the asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> the asteroid is must be very hard to handle. So why do you think that there was so much? It seems like there was a lot of call for what you did in the community there was a, a, a gap that you were filling why do you think that that gap existed yeah, they, well i mean wh what a great question <laughs> because i think i think everybody would like to find some singular experience that says it's worse now mm. 
But I think we've tolerated and ignored and miscategorized a lot of things like autism. Mm -hmm. I, I, in, in all the, all the shows about autism that I've done in the past three months, and it's been a lot of them. I, I have an overwhelming sense of shame of how many autistic kids and adults have been locked up over the years in, in mental health or in prison, yeah. you know, locked away, not just locked up. I think we've, I think society has just begun to understand trauma and we are a million miles away from where we were 20 years ago. And I think all of these th- things coming to light has just reinforced the need for a greater understanding of why teens do what they do. Why do they make the risky decisions? It's not, you got a bad attitude, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Depression is not a bad attitude. Anxiety is not a bad attitude. ADHD is not, you can't focus. You need to sit down. You need to just buck up. You need to keep a day timer (laughs) (laughs) and everything else I've been told. Um, And I do keep a day timer. It's one of the only ways I keep my day together, but it's so much more than that. Yeah. It's not the thing that solved all the other problems. No, that's like, that's like telling a a kid with autism to pay attention to body language. Yeah, exactly. We can't do it. (laughs) Well, thank God you came along. I'm cured. Like, (laughs) so, so I think it's the same. I think, I think as we jump into this work deeper and deeper, which psychologists, psychiatrists, brilliant people are, We're like, it is not just simple that it started with a bad attitude. It's not as simple as that your dad was an alcoholic. So now Mm -hmm. you're a pot smoker every day. Mm -hmm. It's more like, huh, my brain is really adept at avoiding pain and discomfort. Yeah. I've had a long day at work. I'm totally exhausted. Hate my job. Hate my boss. Come home. I want to sit on the couch, have two glasses of wine and binge watch 16 episodes of God knows what on Netflix until Netflix goes, uh, are, are you still there? Are you- like, like, are you still watching? Mm-hmm. That's a maladaptive coping strategy. Oh, too much sure. mayonnaise because you love the taste of mayonnaise and you like the way you feel too much soda, too much fast food, mm-hmm. too much exercise, too much maladaptive coping strategies are much more commonplace trauma is way more prolific than we thought. Yeah, Addiction yeah. means I keep doing things to mess up my life and I can't stop. I think the reason why there is such a huge need is because everybody, everybody is realizing how effed up they are, their, their families are, their home life was, their kids, even the really good experiences. You can look back and go, oh, that could have been better. Yeah. And so I think we all need therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great answer. I agree. When you were talking about how autistic people used to be institutionalized, I think the rate of ADHD in the um, inmate population is something like over 50%, 60% of men. So, and I'm sure there are plenty of women in there too that are probably not identified, but it's a huge percentage of neurodivergent people that are incarcerated currently, which is just indicative, I think, of the whole the whole problem, the whole, well, the whole complex problem. Yeah, we, we still are trying to create the consequence that changes something that's not an attitude. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I, and, and that's to, to it's been with a lot of parents that that the teaching around depression is not a feeling. Mm-hmm. Depression is not an attitude. It's a description of brain dysfunction. Yeah. Your brain's activity is depressed. Mm hmm. Well, can't you just fix it with exercise? No, uh, it helps. And it helps in 90 days. In the first place. Yeah. Right. 90 days later with, with everyday vigorous exercise, your brain's going to be producing way more dopamine. Mm-hmm. So we can help a lot. Yeah. But depression keeps you from exercising. Mm-hmm. How? Well, now we're in the study. And that's the part that's hard. Yeah. You know, they're, they're anxious. They just need to, you know, everybody's nervous. No, that's not what anxiety is. Anxiety mm-hmm. lives in the amygdala. The amygdala yeah. is a trauma response. Mm-hmm. Well, the, I had a much more traumatizing. Okay. Well, this isn't about you, is it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, and they probably haven't dealt with their trauma and that's part of the problem. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. And so, so the work becomes to first that I find with families, the intervention is first. This is not a bad attitude. Stop punishing. Mm -hmm. 
This is not about willingness. This is about capability. Stop punishing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean no consequences? Absolutely not. But what it means is that we're going to create consequences, whether react instead of reacting as a form of punishment, Mm -hmm. right? We're going to, we're going to consciously create consequences that show the person, the child, how to exist in society, potentially having to live with what they live with. Mm -hmm. I'm a hard person to live with. I I got a 25 and a 26 year old and a wife of 16 Mm -hmm. years. I'm very aware, uh, hypervigilant, you might say, because that's a side effect of ADHD. I am hypervigilant of how difficult I am to be around, mm-hmm. um, thus leading to criticism, sensitivity, dysphoria. Yeah. Hey, the ADHD adults, I bet you've never heard of CSD. Go look it up. Criticism, sensitivity, dysphoria. At one will smack you across mm-hmm. the face because then you're like, oh, that's why I get butt hurt so easily. <laughs> it's because I'm really hard to live with. So I'm hypersensitive and hypercritical of my own actions and behavior. And God forbid anybody else's. Yeah. Yeah. So there, this is, this is a, so, 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 there's, there's that divergent conversation. I was talking about the first thing that we have to do with a parent is recognize that this is about capability. It's not about willingness. The second thing we have to do is we have to get the work with the parents to take their own emotional experience reaction of their misinterpretation of the experience out of the equation, Mm -hmm. which means if you want to know where that emotion is, you have to go to the thinking, which goes to the experiences, which goes to the parents' prime influence. Mm -hmm. So the parent has to do their work. And the moment they do two, two things very quickly start to happen. Number one, compassion. And number two, prefrontal cortex thinking. Mm -hmm. Every parent I start working with is fatigued, fearful, angry, and anxious. And you don't parent well from that place. I don't care how smart you are. I have been coaching parents for 20 years. If I am any of those four things, I'm sunk. Mm -hmm. So you have to get them to deal with their lack of self-care and many times their lack if not every time, their lack of adult relationship care. Mm -hmm. When you become the caretaker of an identified patient of your family, which is terrible for everybody, Mm -hmm. you start to get caretakers burden burnout. Mm -hmm. And you have to take care of yourself and you have to nurture your adult relationships, Mm -hmm. your your spouses, your co-parenting partners, exes or currents, Mm -hmm. and your support groups. Yeah. Then go parent. Mm Because you're going to parent from a whole different place. So those are the first two things I do with every single parent. Then we can get into how your situation is so special and unique that you're all going to die. (laughs) (laughs) Because once you get there, you realize you're neither. You're not going to die. And it's not super special. In fact, you have to survive. And there's a support group already in play. You got to go join. Yeah. Yeah. That fatigue is such a big piece of the puzzle, I think, for for a lot of us. Um, and I'm speaking as an autistic parent with uh, neurodivergent kids that is maybe has compounded fatigue because of various influences that if you are tired, there's no way you can be compassionate. And if you're not compassionate, there's no way you can approach the child who's having difficulty uh, with your with your thinking brain, with your reasoning on. So yeah. Just when when we talk about <laughs> when we talk about how that slips into anger, anxiety, mm-hmm. and fear and fatigue, look at the first thing. If your child is depressed, or your child is anxious, or your child is using drugs, or your child is self harming, you can take a look. There's one of five things that is dominoing the other four. One of them is missing, and the other four are collapsing. Yeah. Sleep, nutritious food, healthy movement, drinking water, and breathing on purpose. Yep. And those are the literal five foundations of, uh, I don't know how to say this, being alive, like Both. you have to do those yeah. things. Mm-hmm. You have to, but the moment your kid is sneaking out, the moment your kid is, you know, up at four in the morning playing video games and you know, they're not going to get up to school, but you have to go to work and then, and, 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 and now you're laying in bed, not sleeping. Yeah. How do you wake up in the first thing in the morning? You're, you're pounding coffee. Mm -hmm. which is jacking your system way up Mm -hmm. instead of eating a healthy meal, instead of going for a walk and moving your body instead of, instead of, instead of, which guess what? 
coffee as a crutch is a maladaptive coping strategy and it's mm -hmm. setting you up for failure. Do I drink coffee every day as much as I can? But I also hit the gym. Mm -hmm. I breathe on purpose. Yeah. I really work on my sleep structure. I drink a lot of water. So you have to maintain the foundations of your self-care. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What are some suggestions you have that parents can do right now to, you know, help support their kiddos? My, my biggest suggestion is supported by so much research and it's so stupid, simple, and it's free family dinner. Mm -hmm. It is literally the number one thing that keeps your kid from risky behavior. Yeah. This, this means you sit down. If you can cook together and clean together, you get a thousand million billion extra <laughs> bonus <laughs> points. Yeah. But, but if you just eat together, together, you've gotten an A plus plus. And this means no TV. This means no electronics. This means you parents, because it's easy to point fingers. But honestly, if you work with me, it's mirrors up mm -hmm. mirrors, not fingers. So all the electronics go off. Phones go off. No one leaves the phone rings. It can wait. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a busy life. So do your teenagers. And, and what's important to you? Well, I have to talk to, they have to talk to someone too. Someone is always in crisis. Mm -hmm. You can, you can wait. You can yeah. eat, a, eat a meal with your kids. Yeah. It is the number one thing. The second thing you can do, um, which has as much research behind it is, getting to know your child's friends, parents, mm -hmm. we, how, how many of us can so easily let roll off the tongue? Well, it takes a village. Well then become one, mm -hmm. create one and start with the ones who are already living in your child's purview. Mm -hmm. The third thing is something to do for your child between three o'clock and seven o'clock. Now that one's not always free, Yeah, but we have always said, idle hands do the devil's work. Mm -hmm. If there is nothing to do between three o'clock and seven o'clock. And I understand mortgages. I understand rent. I understand having to work, find something, yeah. something organized, something structured. Mm -hmm. The final thing, which may or may not be free is the honest to God, real understanding of how brains work. Uh, you don't have to become a neurophysicist, but you do have to understand because when your kid comes to you with 14 million Google articles on how weed is not addictive, mm -hmm. you have to be prepared to have that conversation and understand yeah. what a nondamide is and what, a, and understand what a neuromodulator is mm -hmm. and understand how anything can be addictive because I know razor blades aren't addictive. Mm -hmm. So why do kids act like junkies around them when they're self-harming? Mm -hmm. What's going on in the brain? Yeah. And that's what we need to know. If, you're, if your kid's on the spectrum, if your kid's neurodivergent, ADHD, if your child's bipolar, if your child is dealing with addiction, with self-harm, with, then research it mm -hmm. like you would if your child had cancer mm -hmm. and you knew there was something you could discover to help. Yeah. Go to that place. Mm -hmm. that's so important the parent research it's so important thank you so much where can listeners find you if they want to learn more especially now that you're off doing all these new things <laughs> <laughs> first place i want to go is uh there there are two free places i want to send you no first free place is my podcast beyond risk and back if this conversation has been for you if you're like well oh, he's talking to me check out my show. You can it's listen really to Danielle's show. show. Thank you. You can listen <laughs> to Danielle's show and mine together because you got plenty of food to cook for family dinner. So please listen to Beyond Risk and Back. The second place is go to Facebook if you're willing and <laughs> join Parenting Teens That Struggle. It is a private group moderated by me and my daughter. And it is called Parenting Teens That Struggle. I post there every day. I put videos. I put my podcasts. And there are 1,600 parents who are going, what the f And asking their questions. And those 1,600 parents are answering. And it is an instant support community of people who are going through the real deal. Now, if you're interested in an extremely affordable coaching by me, all of my coaching is online. Go to brabapp.com, B-R-A-B-A-P-P.com, brabapp.com. It is a 56-class coaching course, and I promise you, it is 
costs less than a week's worth of coffee because I want every parent to have access to the coaching strategies that I've been teaching for the last 20 years. They're broken up into th three segments, the red, the yellow, and the green. Uh, green is good. Things are going good. You know, they could be great though. You know, this kid's a world changer. So what do you, what changes do you make? Mm -hmm. The yellow, the at risk, uh oh, we're seeing some things, little nervous. This isn't good. Found some weed. Grades are still okay. What do I do? Well, we got your yellow strategies. And then we got the red. And those are the kids that are off the deep end. The families are in crisis. We got your red strategies there too. Mm -hmm. So brabapp.com uh, for very affordable. And then parenting teens that struggle on Facebook for free and be on risk and back for free. Awesome. Thank you, folks. You're Links welcome. will be below. So please check out everything. And thank you so much for being here with us today. That was fantastic. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you so much for joining us on the Neurodiverging Podcast today. I hope you found it helpful and got something out of it. If you did, please go ahead to Apple Podcasts or any other podcast review place and leave a review. It really helps other folks find us. Go ahead and check out the show notes for reading recommendations and all of Aaron's links, including a link to his podcast, Beyond Risk and Back, which is fantastic. I'm not just saying that. You really should go check it out. And as always, please remember, we are all in this together. Thank you.